Grace, mercy, and peace is yours from God our Father, from our Lord and Savior Jesus Christ. Amen. Our text for today is from the Gospel of St. Matthew, the 18th chapter. I'd like to reread a small part of that to you. And in anger his Lord handed him over to be tortured until he would pay his entire debt. So my heavenly Father will also do to every one of you if you do not forgive your brother or sister from your heart. My dear friends, that should be enough, shouldn't it? Punishment for not forgiving sins, spelled out in those scary words, ought to be enough. Ought to be enough for us to realize that God has called us to forgive other people, to forgive them all the time, to be loving to them. This is a story which is told in response to Peter getting it. To Peter understanding that forgiveness is not just about something that we can do when we feel like it. That forgiveness is something we have to be focused on because of who we are in Jesus Christ. That it's not about confronting, as we talked about last week, it's not about confronting people so that we can win the argument or be right. The reason we confront sin is so that we can gain a brother or sister, so that we can forgive. And even when it doesn't work, even when we have to go through multiple steps and it doesn't work, we are to continue to forgive, continue to reach out, continue to care for and love people even when they don't want that love. Praying for our enemies, loving our enemies, praying for those who persecute us. So this is an interesting place that it ends, that the story ends, because here we have this, this strong threat this strong punishment that Jesus talks about. So my Heavenly Father will do to every one of you if you do not forgive your brother or sister from your heart. It ought to be enough. And you know what? The interesting thing is we all know it's not. Because the fact of the matter is that fear of punishment rarely, if ever, changes our behavior. Fear of punishment is not what helps us get through the day and figure out how to do the right things. It's just fear, and we try our best not to think about it. Fear is part of the sin of the world. It's part of the brokenness of the world. Fear is something that the angels say to us not to have. Fear not. For when coming into the presence of angels who are obviously fearsome beings because they represent God who is pure and holy and we are sinful, they're constantly saying to us, set that fear aside. Apparently, it's not helpful to who we are. Jesus tells this story, tells this, this entire story for us to help us understand and illustrate God's forgiveness in our lives, but then also our problem. The story is one where he starts with a situation of a slave who owes so much that it would be impossible for that slave to ever pay it back. 10,000 talents. We're talking about a massive amount of money. I'm not even sure if you would ask the question, how could a slave have that much that they owed their master? We wouldn't even know. But apparently the only way that the master would have been able to get value back out of this would have been to sell that slave and his family and everything that they owned, which would have been his right to do in Jesus' time. But the slave comes to him, pleads with him, and says, I will, I will pay you back. And notice that that's, that's the, the impetus of what happens. The slave saying... I will pay you back. I'll work this out. And really, that's impossible. There's nothing the slave can do to pay things back. And yet, it is the master who then forgives him all of the debt, frees him from all of that, and gives him his life back. Clearly, there is a picture here for us of our relationship with God. We were dead to our trespasses and sins. There was nothing we could do to pay back. Nothing we could do to fix it with God. How often have you found yourself, I know I've found myself numerous times, wanting to say to God, God, if you'll just, if you'll just work this out for me, I will. You fill in the blanks, right? We bargain with God. We come up with ways that we want to fix things with God. Even though we are the ones who are broken and we are the ones who don't measure up to the way God created us. And even though we can't do anything to remove that, those mistakes from our lives, we still do it. We still try to bargain. We still try to work things out. And God in His mercy forgives us. Forgives us all the time. 
wipes all that away, purifies us, makes us whole. And here are the things that I was thinking about last night that God forgives. God forgives what we cannot fix in our lives. The things we can't work out, the things we can't salvage, God fixes them. We've all been in that situation before where some mistake we've made, something we have done has broken things, has messed things up, and there's nothing we can do to make it right. But God fixes it. God forgives when we do not deserve it. When do we ever really deserve to be forgiven? Only when we've made up for it, right? And yet God forgives and fixes things when we don't deserve it. And there's nothing we can do to fix it. And then finally, and this is probably for me the most important thing, God forgives everything. There's nothing I can do wrong that God can't forgive. Let me say that again a different way. All the things I can mess up, all the mistakes I can make, all the ways that I can blow it in my life, God can forgive and can work those things out and fix them for me. That's pretty powerful stuff. And like Peter, we get it. God calls us to forgive other people, says so in the Lord's Prayer, forgive us our trespasses as we forgive others. So in the same way that God forgives us, we too want to go and forgive others. We know that what, that's what God calls us to, but like Peter, we not only get it, but we ask, how often? Hands straight up, you know? Do I, do I got to do this once in a while? Do I got to do this a certain number of times? Uh, there's got to be some limits on this, God. And I think one of the things we find out in family is we can either live way God said, which is forgiving all the time, or we're going to have struggles. Because the minute we put limits on how often and when we can forgive, we find ourselves acting like that first slave, don't we? We find ourselves getting in, but immediately looking for the people who owe us. We immediately have restrictions on God's love and forgiveness that we're going to put on other people. God may have no restrictions. God may forgive everything, but I, I've, got a, I've got a few restrictions. Let, let me share them with you. If somebody needs forgiveness from me, one of the first restrictions to come up is, you have to ask. We all know that, right? You can't be forgiven unless you ask. But there's a problem with that. It says to us that the uh, slave came to him, and he fell on his knees, and, and he said, have patience with me, and I will pay you everything. Hmm. Did he ask for forgiveness? Did he ask for it to go away? That was beyond anything he could comprehend. Kind of like in the children's message, when you're that child who comes up and you've just messed up the teacher's desk and you've ruined things, there is nothing you can comprehend that's going to fix it or that you can give back. So you don't, and you certainly don't ask for forgiveness at that moment because you can't believe that it's possible. And yet God forgives when it's impossible. When we haven't asked, God sent Jesus to die for our sins, even though we wouldn't know what to ask for. I have other restrictions. You have to be sorry. You, you got to be sorry. Otherwise, if you're coming to me and you're not sorry for what you did, then why should I forgive you? I am sure. Ask my kids. They'll tell you. I probably said that. Okay? All right? Not great theology, but we say that as parents, okay? You gotta be sorry. You, you have to say you're sorry, otherwise you can't be forgiven, right? And again, we go back to the text and we find that he says to them, have patience with me and I will pay you everything. The only thing the slave says is that same bargaining thing that we like to say. Give me some more time. I'll do something. I don't know what it is, but I'll figure something out and I'll pay you back. But that doesn't work. And rarely does. Okay, so my last restriction, okay? We've worked through the first two. My last restriction is, I'll say to people, you have to change. You have to do better next time. You have to somehow recognize from, if I'm going to forgive you and wipe this one away, you, you, you got you to gotta work it out in your life that you're not going to make this mistake again. Okay, how many of you are good at doing that, right? i got to put my hand down quickly. We, 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 we don't, right? We make a mistake, we do something wrong, and, and before we know it, we're standing there doing the same dumb thing again, going, wait a minute, why, why did I do that? I, I, I just, 
I just got over messing up this over here and, and now I'm messing it up again over here. And, and I'm thankful for the forgiveness I had over here. It didn't last very long, did it? And again we find that in the example Jesus gives us, there is no talk of, of changing. In fact, the example shows us very clearly that the slave was forgiven but didn't change. But still received that forgiveness. Now, we know how the story ends. We know that because the slave didn't change and didn't forgive and went on and did what he did, it was a punishment. And as Christians, we know that it's important. It's important to ask for forgiveness. It's important to repent. It's important to be sorry for our sins. We know that. And we know that's part of the process that we should engage in and that God calls us to engage in in that relationship of forgiveness. But the important part of the text is that Jesus is there to provide forgiveness when we don't deserve it, when we can't fix it, when we're not sorry, when we don't change, when we never ask. That's how great the love of the Father is, that He would send Jesus to die for even those things. That He would send Jesus to die to cover all of our sins all the time. And it's from there that He says to us, go. It's from that place of always having our sins forgiven and always knowing that we are connected to God and knowing that we are in heaven. It's from that place that God calls us to go and forgive others. To go and share this message of grace and love. Now, I gotta tell you, it's not gonna be easy. As I, as I thought through last night the uh, children's message, I gotta be honest with you. I thought, you know what, this is way too transparent. Okay, as, as I talked to them about, about spilling the things on the teacher's desk and all that, as, as they're, they're going to know, they're going to see. The minute I go back to the next piece and I talk about your toy being broken, they're going to go, well, I guess we got to forgive because we were forgiven. You know, it, it's going to go badly, right? i got to tell you, the minute I said it, that, that some of their best friends stepped on their favorite toy, faces fell, and, and you couldn't see it, it was great. Faces fell and anger sort of rose up, okay? And the first response was, was, was brutally honest, I'm going to be angry. <laughs> and I thought, wow, there's something we can learn from children, right? And what we learn from children is that they will give us the honest answer that comes from the depths of our being as we react, which is, do something that hurts me or hurts somebody that I love, and I'm going to be angry. And it doesn't matter how often or how much I've forgiven, been forgiven, I have to work to suppress that part of me that wants to be angry. It's a work. And Jesus tells us it's a work. And St. Paul tells us that we should think on these things, dwell on these things. He tells us that the gifts of the Spirit are love and joy and peace and patience and kindness and goodness and self-control. And tells us to dwell on those things and to think on those things because the, our focus needs to not be on the hurt not beyond what others have done to us, but it needs to be on what Jesus has done for us. It needs to be on that forgiveness that has always been a perfect and pure gift that we didn't deserve, could, could not earn, and always needed. My brothers and sisters in Christ, you'll find this week people who do hurtful things. And I can guarantee that what they need is love and forgiveness. You'll find people do hurtful things not because they want to be hurtful, but because oftentimes they just are feeling the discomfort of their own sin, their own grief, their own struggle. And the more we can love them, the more we can forgive them, the more we can care for them as Jesus has first cared for us, the more we will find that we can have positive relationships and that that forgiveness can change lives because fear does not change lives and behavior, but God's love does, and forgiveness will. Amen. Will you pray with me? Lord God, our Heavenly Father, will you help us this week? Will you help us to prepare to forgive? And will you help us to act in a forgiving manner? Will you help us to forgive the people and the places and the times and the things that are the most difficult? Not because we fear, but because we rejoice. We rejoice in the love and the forgiveness that you have given to us in your Son, Jesus. In his name we pray. Amen.